Okay, good evening everyone, uh, bonsoir à tous et à toutes, and welcome to tonight's session of OTF Connects, titled Developmental Continua as Assessment Tools from Kindergarten to Grade 3 Mathematics, with Matthew Aldridge. Uh, we have a, a fairly large group tonight, uh, with um, about um, half and half in terms of uh, experience and new users, and uh, as I said, you guys are mostly located in the southern part of the province. Um, I suspect that uh, many of you uh, already participated in Matt's uh, previous uh, session earlier this month uh, called Mathematize This. Matt, you and I uh, have worked together on a few OTF Connect sessions in the past. I must say it's always a pleasure to moderate for him. He brings a particularly uh, informal and refreshing approach to our OTF Connect program. Um, I'm expecting that tonight uh, won't be any different and um, it should be a lot of fun. Um, as usual, I would like to, uh, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, not as good. I would like to thank you all for taking the time um, from your families to meet us over at TF Connects and share your ideas and experience with us throughout the evening. Uh, et comme d'habitude, je voudrais aussi profiter de l'occasion pour souhaiter la bienvenue à nos collègues franco-ontariens. Nos sessions sont euh, principalement en anglais, mais si vous désirez obtenir des informations en français, surtout n'hésitez pas à me contacter par la suite. We are definitely uh, thrilled to have each and every one of you with us tonight. It's also our absolute pleasure to welcome Matthew Aldridge. As uh, many of you already know, Matthew is a resource teacher of mathematics in the alternative program of the Peel District School Board. I've been uh, always particularly impressed with uh, his famous one-line resume. Uh, if you have been already in previous sessions, you know that uh, that's the way uh, Mathieu likes to be introduced. So I'm going to open the virtual quotation marks and say that Mathieu is a father, educator, TEDx speaker, thinker, writer, and tweeter. And uh, he usually follows that by a smiley. And uh, I'm now closing the quotation marks. Uh, and I must say, Matthew, that know that uh, Twitter has increased its allowance to 280 characters. Uh, maybe you will feel some pressure to reveal a bit more about yourself for the next session. Anyway, so um, feel free to uh, click on your talk button, Matt, uh, anytime you want to turn your mic on and, uh, and, and take, take over, and the class is yours. And uh, I think it's a pretty good group tonight, so that's great. great. Um, thanks very much, Michelle. Always a pleasure. Um, I've resisted the 280 characters because the bigger tweets just looked weird to start with, but maybe I'll start using them. Um, so welcome tonight. Uh, so tonight I wanted to focus on different developmental continua that are out there uh, because there are a number and how they affect our assessment in mathematics and indeed make it simpler. And that's what tonight's about. I know it can be confusing to see all these different resources. Um, so there's going to be a lot of links to how to get the resources tonight. And we're just going to keep it real and just talk really, really plainly, I hope, because that's what I like to do about mathematics education. Uh, please tweet lots, tag me, and OTFPD. Uh, I, saw, I read a blog post the other day. Um, it was by Blend, Brenda Sherry. I think, and um, she rightly noted that OTF is doing some of the most amazing stuff in the province uh, with uh, professional development for teachers. And so the OTF Connect series on its own, I believe this is the second last one of this year until the winter season, is absolutely massive. You could take several a week for months on end, and they're all with amazing people on amazing topics. Um, not only that, um, we put on a summer conference, a three-day math conference, in Toronto last summer. Um, there is research projects, um, of which I've also read some of them. Uh, there is just so much going on. I think I'm actually forgetting something. OTF is right in there with our professional learning these days, and um, I think it's on us to take advantage of it. It's a wonderful thing. So do tag them, tweet any learnings. Screen captures is one of my favorite things these days. Screen snip tool, whether it's the Windows one, if you're on a iOS device or mobile, it's easy. You can tweet those easily. Um, just do what you do. Um, we already linked to my Twitter feed. Um, which brings me to 
another point is that tonight the route I chose to go was to make it absolutely jam-packed with links. So everything is linked. As a matter of fact, I think we mentioned um, I'm a TEDx speaker. I think I put in my two TEDx links. They're fun. They're not actually directly related to tonight, to tonight, but they're fun. All the developmental stuff is linked. There's videos. I linked to an old presentation I did that took this even farther, out to multiplying and dividing. Uh, and then I linked to a slide deck from another presentation. There's just links, 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 all kinds of stuff to read or videos to watch. And if, if your style of learning is to juggle um, many, many tabs at the same time while you're listening, do so. Um, just do so. And then the takeaways can be the links. Uh, so here, I mean, look, math should be full of surprise and wonder. And we should be playing with numbers, especially in primary. I don't think we play with numbers enough. I think that we should. I think that numbers are interesting to play with and that they're wonderful in their own right. And we want kids to see that. And on that note, for tonight, I, I bat around various ideas, but I decided to focus on from counting up to multiplying because that's a massive landscape which obviously ties into other areas of mathematics. But I noticed there was other sessions on fractions. Um, so I let fractions be. There's other stuff on spatial reasoning, so I let that be. And just focused on number tonight. So playing with numbers. Um, it's my son, Alec, but we try out some math ideas at home. Um, I believe I linked to um, Francis Sue's talk, which is amazing. And I quote it all the time, but basically he, he situates play as a, a basic human need. And he does say that play builds hope. And I say that maybe math itself, if we make it playful, um, can build hope. So that math on its own can build hope. And uh, I think that's a really key point. And if you do listen to Sue's talk, the most inspirational part of it is um, that he was inspired by a prisoner, so someone who is literally in jail who teaches himself mathematics. So learning mathematics literally gives himself hope. Um, just as we frame my thinking about assessment for tonight, okay, my thinking right now, and I refer to this Kathy Bruce paper a lot, is that a teacher observed in doing some collaborative increase in co-teaching that they realized that so much of their students' thinking wasn't making the paper. And I would hope that all of us have had that realization. I have. It was when I started letting my students talk and think and open up more and to really listen to them. So I wasn't just interacting with the paper products or the worksheets or even problems done on paper. I was interacting with them and I was really hearing them. Okay. And so this was a big revelation for a participant in this research project. It's a revelation for me and hopefully for you. So when we speak of assessment, particularly in K-3, to and particularly in 1-3, to where the grading comes in, hopefully we're really listening. We're taking those notes, maybe even those video or audio recordings. And we're thinking about where our kids are in their thinking, which is the theme of tonight. So developmental continuum are about where students are in their thinking. And just remember that it's not always on the paper. Uh, framing, as always, with, uh, I like to say, when I do professional systems, like framing with things that are uh, non-negotiable. And growing success is, it's hard to believe that it's 2006, but certain of the ideas certainly have permeated their, our work. And certain ideas need um, to, to sink in more. Um, and so I think assessment is a non-negotiable. And evaluation for grade one and up in the end, end of terms is non-negotiable. And with the current strands, that part's non-negotiable. But the important part is how we actually do it. So tonight, I'm not going to present any big theoretical pieces on assessment. I'm not going to present you any graphic organizers or frameworks. 
because I think the development will continue itself. The mathematics themselves are the framework, but what we're doing is documenting student thinking along the way. But I wanted to bring back to growing success. Oh, one thing that I'm not sure is in there, but has been uh, inspiring me lately. And so the original Latin roots of assessment, asidere, me, literally means to sit beside. And so lately that's the work I've been doing in grade seven and eight, but the work I've been doing is sitting beside kids and talking about what they're thinking in mathematics. And it's unrealistic probably on any given day to sit beside, but I think it can be done. Um, one of the teachers I was with today, she, um, she'll have, she'll sit with four or five kids at a time. Or you may choose to focus on just two. You're working on a given task or problem, just focus on a few for that day. Or realistically, if you're focusing on maybe a certain strategy, you only need to, there's some kids you don't need to hear from because you already know they have that strategy. So always coming back to the policy documents. That's very important to me. So I always like to start with mathematics. So this is actually a very serious counting problem from the history of counting. So before we talk about counting, I like to start professional sessions with doing the math. Can you total the numbers from 1 to 100? I will say this to you. You're going to object and say, I'm not doing this in kindergarten. No, in grade 1, I don't think you are. In grade two, you might, maybe towards the end, or maybe with the calculator. And in grade three, you definitely could. Um, we're, I want to engage with this one as is because it's interesting. Okay, it's a really ancient, interesting problem. But you could adapt this for grade one. Here's how. Can you total the numbers from one to five? Can you total the numbers from one to 10? Guess what? There's a number of picture books. Like I believe the very hungry caterpillar is a lot like that. How many things did the caterpillar eat? So just take it down to a smaller number. Okay, so but let's try this as it is. So what I'd like in the next five minutes, if you come up with something and you email your strategy to Michelle, um, he can so you take a picture of it and email it quickly to him. We can get a few on the screen as slides, so you'll see what people do. Um, before you start working. Okay, I didn't mean to give that part away um, if you saw it. But Humble 100 Square is a thinking tool. So you can, we have a link coming to um, a interactive 100 Square. But you can just Google 100 Square. The 100 Square, I've seen this with kids. I've seen this with grade three, I think, last year. And um, 100 Square helped them a ton. So if you Google that quickly or anything you sketch out on paper, um, we would love to see. And so maybe we'll start, you know, I'll start counting for like five minutes. Um, and you might surprise yourself, but I want you to pay attention to how you're not going to sit. You're going to go one plus two is three, plus three is six, plus four is ten. Sure, but you're not going to do that. You're going to find something else that makes it maybe more efficient. Or you're going to use some knowledge of adding or indeed even multiplying. And probably you're going to be able to give an answer. It is tricky. I, w I would echo with Melanie, but once this, this problem, once it unlocks, you may consider just like quickly Google 100 square as an image, and then, um, yeah, the 100 square is a powerful tool, as Francesca is talking about. If you were to quickly Google 100 square and just take a look and get 1 to 100, what could you do? Um, and I, I've seen participants have amazing revelations. Again, if you don't make it all the way and you're still puzzling, Hopefully we'll get a few on screen, but I'll we'll still talk about it and how you may use it in the class. So let's develop some thinking here. Oh, by the way, I guess if you wanted to just put ideas in the chat box, that's good as well, or email the pictures if you're doing it on, on paper. Or indeed, if you're doing it, like if you were to um, screen capture 100 square, and for those who are on iPads and you're on iOS 11, if you do a screen capture, it drops it right to the bottom left. It's all ready for it to be annotated on. It's amazing. You could do some work on there, too. So I'll just pause myself for about five minutes. OK, everyone, I'm going to paste my email address again in the chat box. Uh, yeah, hold on a second. 
So if you guys are doing the exercise on paper, you can actually email that to me and I'll try to grab the pictures from your email and I'll try to load them. And uh, Matthew, I just noticed that Nancy and Nimet just joined, so they don't know what the exercise is about. So you may want to just explain it one more time for Nancy and for Nimet that they've just joined the, the class. Yeah, we did. Um, there was some preamble slides where I talked about what we're doing tonight and just some things I believe. But um, now we're doing this math problem. It's quite old, uh, and you could say that um, it's a really interesting structure. And I noted that for younger kids, we would use smaller numbers, but I think we're all okay doing totaling from 1 to 100. Pay attention to strategy. Don't try and add the whole way because it would take too long. It would be boring. The calculator would mess up or whatever. But um, And if you were to Google 100 square and just take a look at that structure um, that's on there and see what you notice. And then you can email Michelle, and then if um, we already have ideas coming in, which is fantastic. And we'll get so hopefully we'll get some solutions on the screen, if not in the chat box. So we already have ideas. Yes, yeah, so we're giving you a few more uh, a few more minutes if you want to uh, do that. And obviously, I see that. And I, as I've mentioned, most participants are usually more comfortable um, putting their responses in the chat box. But uh, I just saw Deidre just send me something, so I'm going to check what it is. So this is what I just received from Deidre. Matt, if you want to uh, address yeah. that. Uh, yeah. Ah, find groups of 100. OK. Yes, there's some clues there as to what's happening. If you wanted to, you can write on the screen beside and show what you're thinking as well. I'm pretty sure I know. but Oh, I see. One goes with 99, two goes with 98. Are you able to write on the screen and total beside? That'd be my challenge for you. Okay, so adding in a row or column, and some kids will try that. Um, let's see. Typically, they'll go horizontally first, so they'll add from one to ten first. Okay, and so so from Ruth, there we're looking at how many groups of a hundred. Yeah. I think that um, and Deirdre points to something that is usually, I don't think I did today, but usually I put in a thinking is messy slide with some really messy work from when I had a, uh, maybe grade eight. But it's, um, I like to talk about that. I like messy work. We used to have chart paper all over the walls, and kids would be reading them on their lunch. So I was always proud of that. Now, as we see the ideas coming in, we see the structure of the problem maybe starts to reveal itself, but the structure of the number system organized in the rows of 10 in the hundreds chart helped us. Each column is 10 more than the one before. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that is a, let's see, each column. And then I'm trying to do that in my head. I think of what I know about that. First row. And so already we have a um, conjecture about the answer. And that'll happen too. So there'll be a certain point. If you were to give this problem or the modified, you know, lower number version to kids, there'd be a certain point where they're, they're in that sweet spot, you know, because of problem solving where the answer starts to be uh, around the room. What's interesting is like for three and now fourth year, I'm more of an observer in classrooms because I don't have my own. And so I notice things like <laughs> the sweet spot of problem solving. So depending on the length of the problem, you know, like 30 to 40 minutes, and you'll see these groups, you know, are pairs, and they're not even talking to each other in the sweet spot. They'll start to have the answer. 
So I think the answer is starting to come in. So we have two answers that are quite close. Um, again, not a big deal because um, it's, just, it's just not a big deal. Or in the end, sure, yeah, we'll get a number, but we can uh, we can explore the two and decide if we're right. And already we have so maybe a hypothesis that was wrong. Yeah, that'll, that's part of the process. We show that we value thinking. Um, we show that we value thinking when we value process. So in the solution that's currently on the screen, we had 1 plus 99 is 100, 2 plus 98 is 100. Is that going to get us all the way? So is that extendable, generalizable? I might, I have a ton of ground to cover. Oh, let's see, 1 to 91 is 460. 550 in the final column, so we have 190. Okay, that looks right. Here's the frustrating part where it's um, potentially, because I want to cover a bunch of ground, I'm going to potentially take some thinking away. by pulling the curtain away. So we have, we have between, I think, 4,095, 4,500, 5,050. So somewhere in there lies the answer, or one of the three is the answer. Um, OK, in the interest of time, I really, really hate to do this. But so as a very young man, I think seven or eight, um, Carl Friedrich Goss, who is one of the most famous mathematicians, he had this insight. Honestly, I think he was just playing. Actually, I believe his teacher gave him this problem. And so what he did, I don't believe he had a hundreds chart, but in his head he rearranged it. Okay, so consider that hundreds chart. Um, 1 plus 100 is 101. 2 plus 99 is 101. And 3 plus 98 is 101, all the way out to 50 plus 51 is 101. So my groupings are 50 groupings of 101. So I think you can probably um, have some sense of the answer. So if Carl Friedrich's teacher thought um, he was punishing him, but Carl was up to the challenge. Um, indeed, the structure of this, um, kind of what he found, if you generalize it, um, for a sequence is extendable out to infinity. So number times number plus one divided by two. That is what he found. So 100 times 101 divided by two should give 5,050. So for any n, so if we were to say a, a thousand, it should be a thousand times a thousand one. I know that we probably wouldn't reveal this. What's behind the curtain? It's not going to make much sense in grade three. But uh, just keep that in the back of your mind. So that's what makes it so interesting to do it um, this way. Okay. Yeah, five thousand fifty. So. But it just goes to show that young children are capable of big and interesting math. But I'm going to leave this here um, and leave for you to think about. So if it was grade two or three or beyond, if that's what you teach and you're just sitting in tonight to learn, you might say, well, what's my learning goal? Can I attach it to a curriculum expectation? Sure you could. A process expectation? Sure you could. You might look at some reasoning and strategies, for example. But I do believe you could attach it to a specific expectation about number for each grade. Or if you just wanted to play, that's OK. So there's the 100 tool, which um, if we don't meet it again on our way tonight, uh, is such an important tool for kids. You can think of skip counting and grouping. And you can think of 
from counting, getting all the way to the times tables and multiplying, and just the patterns. And indeed, we already have notes um, from Ruth, grade one, looking at patterns. And indeed, my son did that last year. A reminder from the pedagogical documentation, there's two of them, monographs. I think this is from the original, but there's also a revisited, or I might have that backwards. There's two documents. So it looks like conversations, things kids say, observations, what they're doing, and then products, what they've represented. Okay, so it's again, project, products through the lens of um, representing, which is interesting, because usually we think of a static pencil and paper product, but representing makes me think it's more like a, you know, a product of the mathematics of my mind brought into the world. Okay, so and it talks about observing with the pedagogy of listening. And again, if, if we, if this is our skill set that we work on and this is our daily assessment philosophy, you know, we've got enough to go on and that's really important. Okay, so getting into it. So you may have heard along your uh, travels and your work, terms like landscape, trajectory, pathway, um, or continuum. Um, they give us ideas, so they're all different maps, we could say, to learning. And in this case, we might be talking about a landscape of um, early numeracy. Okay, so like Alex Lawson's book, What to Look For, is literally about counting, adding, and subtracting. Um, but give us ideas of strategies kids might use and the ideas that are at play, okay, and strategies that we might expect to see. So these are all things that are wrapped up in this sort of thinking, and indeed it's thinking about mathematics developmentally, not just at the grade level. And so see the quote from um, Roy and Lee from York Region. I just heard him say that, and so I quote him. But, you know, it's not about the grade two expectation having to do with two digit uh, and two digit multiple or addition rather. Um, it could be about the things that have happened along the way to get there. And so it could be that there's problems all the way down to counting or skip counting. Okay. Because usually we just look for, okay, well, 29 plus 37, we'd look for problems with regrouping, replace value. And indeed, that could be somewhere in there. The chances are the problem's a little further back on these landscapes. That's just one example. So know where kids are in their understanding and where they're likely going. So if you look at the Fosno multiplying landscape, which we will have linked soon, that um, you would expect skip counting to be one of those underlying basis. So that counting by threes can lead to multiplying by three, which seems like an obvious statement, but it's something that we can specifically look for. Uh, and so assessment, assessment, assessment. I have seen specifically thinking about Fosno landscapes and then the landscape in, in the front of Alex Lawson's book. I've seen it photocopied and literally going around looking at specific kids, looking for specific strategies and ideas. And that's assessment through the lens of mathematics. Okay, So it's never just about your grade level. You're figuring, figuring out what to look for. And then the like the intervention, so what are we expecting, what do, what do we need to happen, what tasks do we need to give to move, I guess, student A from concept A to B. And then student B may need something a little different to happen along the way because the paths could be a little different. Okay, so demystifying the language a little bit. Here's four things that you might have heard, which are definitely not the same. So if you look at Doug Clements and, and Julie Sarama's work, they mean a specific thing by trajectory, and Fosno means a specific thing by landscape. But I think the commonality is they're, they're about how kids develop their thinking in mathematics. So I call this puzzling the landscape landscape. Uh, you can have, and they will all be linked right in, so don't worry. Just keep those links, think about it. If you're familiar with some of them, that's great. Um, Clements and Sarama, that's a book. I do think pieces of that you can find on the internet. Um, Clements also wrote, I guess, the, the pivotal, pivotal article about subitizing. They call it 
the trajectory approach. So a learning goal, the developmental continuum, and the strategies you use. That's what they're calling a trajectory. Prime, which is by Nelson and Marion Small, has developmental continuum. Continuum because it's all strands, but what you might call maps. And big ideas, although she didn't call them yet, they were um, key concepts at the time. Ooh, strands. Pardon that, that should say strands, obviously. Bosno landscapes, which are typically included in her kits, but also her books. So they include big ideas in the math, strategies, and models. So if you're familiar with that, there's uh, triangles and ovals. And then her books. Um, Fosno's book on, on multiplying and dividing are just absolutely wonderful, well written. I had the chance to speak to her on, a, a, I guess, a podcast or, a, yeah, like an internet radio series called Not a Book Study in the Spring. And uh, they inspire with how they're written. Uh, they really are quite lovely. And What to Look For, which is by Alex Lawson, which is from Pearson which hopefully you have some in your school. It's quite pricey, but worth every penny for the early landscape of counting, adding, subtracting, and multiplying, which is where we are tonight. Um, Pearson, their mathology box is out. Uh, I have it, and I know the developmental continua they've used, they sort of researched all the others and made their own. And again, there's big ideas, key concepts, and so on. Okay, and I, you have my word that Pearson's is... Um, like it's just readable and usable. Um, readable and usable. And, and Nelson's products are going to going to have the same, I believe, based on what I know. So that's the landscape landscape. And there may be a few other things along the way. You might be thinking, well, what on earth do I use? And I think there's some personal choices to make. There's different terms that some of these authors and researchers use that others don't, and that's okay. Some people love their FOSNO kits. Some people just love those landscapes and they develop their own tasks. I think you need to make them personal choices. And my learning journey, this is where we start, because my most of my work was grade six to eight. Um, connecting the landscape of counting to the landscape of adding and subtracting. I didn't know that, so I did my junior intermediate training, and then later I did the primary basic, and then now I have the primary junior part one, two, and three, and I teach them, and I'm like, well, it's really obvious. Um, York's primary junior part one, for example, does a great job, and it's structured as from counting all the way to multiplying and dividing. Sure enough, but nobody taught me that. So I used to joke when the word subitizing appeared in my life that we should make it into a drinking game because all of a sudden the whole world was talking about subitizing. Um, so creating bridges between the operations, and not just taking it for granted that uh, you race to the algorithm and that's the end, and then using that evidence of student thinking to identify needs, determine instructional next steps, select appropriate and responsive tasks, to support student thinking. And indeed, that's my big assessment message tonight. It's not fancy, but it's a pedagogy of listening. And it's those three bullets right here. OK, then this is uh, quite a quick tour through the early landscape. I know this was important, though. So learning to count. So babies discerning you know, between one, and then two, and three, and then many. And then knowing that sets are sets. And you'll know when their sense of fairness develops, as well as like cardinality of a set. Because if you have a brother and well, I have two boys, and so if I were to try and give one, you know, three candies and the other two, well, they certainly do know the cardinality of those sets. Because one has more candy. Uh, but so between three and four, um, that's cardinality, knowing that the last number counted is how many are there. So in the counting sense, they can count the candies. And then we have the sense of addition as combining. So we're, we're moving along from birth. So I won't joke about subitizing because it's serious business. Um, but in all seriousness, considered to be fundamental, we say instantly seeing. So in the psychological literature, up to four items only. 
But in reality, if we were to think of like a dice, we can instantly see that five or that six. And I think sometimes bigger groups, we can almost instantly supertize them. And let's see. So the bonus Google Slides it has given you are, so there's a slide deck. We did a session for OTF Connects. I think I actually did it. I did this activity twice, and then I think I've done it outside of OTF. And so the educators were putting in their images that they think were good for mathematizing or supertizing. So if you follow that link, you'll see some. But again, that's that mentality. Sometimes you'll see teachers using um, paper plates and bingo daubers for supertizing. But it's, I think it's where the images in, inspire supertizing or counting. Because you can learn a lot just from watching a kid count this set of objects. I'll just give you one example from Alex Lawson's What to Look For. If I count that set and I have to count, um, if I have to count it three times, I'm probably pretty early on in, in my counting ability. So she puts that right after supertizing. But whereas I might get to um, skip counting pretty soon after. Okay. So if I can show some kind of efficiency, like skip counting, I'm probably a, a little further along, a little more, I guess, practiced and skillful um, with counting. Yeah, so you have a, a little slide deck of this, but um, doubles appears. And I think if we were to think of arrays and grouping and multiplying, we can see how doubles, you can see why they appear on Fosno's multiplication landscape, for example. But how many is a really nice prompt. Um, it's actually a really nice prompt just for getting kids to, um, well, to talk about how many, so to get at counting. Um, but really, really stressing in kindergarten, maybe the start of grade one, if you're getting kids to count sets and observing, there's a lot that you can learn. Because sometimes that cardinal sense Okay, that 10 objects is 10, hasn't developed. And I remember going through it with my sons where they would um, double tag. Okay, that's called one-to-one -one tagging. And therefore get the wrong answer. And then I remember the time when all of a sudden he was tagging one-to-one. -one. Okay, do not take making 10 for granted. We have so much um, compressed knowledge so much. I worked with high school teachers last year and that's when I really saw it because we'd get them to think about algebra and they were just had this massively compressed knowledge base. They jump right to the expression, right? Without thinking of everything that might be underneath. Okay. That's one example that we need to decompress that, even if it's just about adding. Even if it's just about making ten. So we see a ten frame pictured. It's half full. And we see an octopus pictured. Um, well, the octopus would um, it would actually love to count in base eight because it has eight, has it has eight limbs. It would have no problem with that, and the different relationships would be available so, um, to the to the octopus, and there'd be different times tables. And adding sure would look a little different because only the digit, digit zero through seven would be available. And I'm just trying to get you to not take that for granted. So making 10 is a major step along the way. Making five even, because we have five fingers and five toes. But don't take that for granted. Or counting over 10. So early grade one, if I do nine plus six, and I need to take, I go nine plus one is 10, and I need to go five more. That'd probably be quite an advanced strategy. But some kids might get stuck on going up over 10. Uh, when, just as an aside, so we have some weirdness in our number system. So some number systems, Japanese, for example, you would neatly say the equivalent of 10, 1, 10, 2, but we say 11 and 12. And I remember when that confused my sons. So we can't even take the granted um, the names of the numbers, and I don't think we should, because that's that whole thing. Is like, because it's not intuitive where 
yeah, kids have to learn the teens. Okay, so what's on your landscape of addition and subtraction? I mean, feel free to pull anything off the link. But um, would you, in the chat box, let's take a few minutes to put some ideas of what should be in this continuum that goes from counting in early number sense to adding and subtracting. Maybe don't worry about the order right now. Just drop those ideas in the box. Uh, loving the ideas, and just as a, a few roll in for the next two minutes, I'll comment on a few. Um, I think the number line, honestly, probably as soon as possible is so key. Um, so getting to like marked number lines, open number line, um, we've, we've notes about manipulative. So that 10 frame, rec and record 10 frame, or the app version thereof. So just tools you can use, um, 100 square for skip counting. We have ideas of representing numbers in different ways, um, using our fingers. Um, all this stuff, uh, all this stuff definitely plays in. So in grade one, you can think of number facts up to 20, right? Um, rolling games, or rolling dice. And so looking at the doubles, I remember when my son started to do that. So doubles become familiar, but there are also groups. So it also lays the groundwork for multiplying. Um, skip counting, just so key. One that's sometimes forgotten is um, counting backwards as well, or skip counting downwards. Uh, we had important notes about um, equality, like using an equal sign, and number families. So let's say 4 plus 1 is 5, 5 minus 1 is 4, 5 minus 4 is 1, and so on. Um, dot plates. Uh, very interesting conversation with some Western researchers, I think, two weeks ago. They were noting how subitizing can be trained to a certain extent. So I think that's where we're using those dot plates. Um, and those dot images. So it could be trained to a certain extent, but a certain extent you can instantly perceive up to four. Or, but I think where it gets interesting is if I were to show you like 24 dots, like Joe Bowler does, and you would see what you actually do with it. Okay, I feel good about that, and I had pictured some teachers doing it because that's a great thing to do. Um, the, the teacher pictured seems to be doing it more. Fosno style, which is pictured, and I'll just jump ahead to that, because there's a link coming to the Fosno landscape, and if you think of moving from the bottom up, she has subitizing at the very bottom, it's the groundwork. And I think it's reasonable to assume this terrain here, how we are right on the edge of understanding and thinking about multiplying. Um, just before we take the um, couple minutes to watch Graham Fletcher's, sorry, G. Fletcher on Twitter, Graham Fletcher's video, I think is worth the three or four minutes, even during webinar time. So if you could follow the link and do that, um, I enjoy how he lays out this continuum. Uh, one note while you um, follow the link and hopefully watch it. Um, there was another Google slide deck that appeared earlier. 
And that was from a three-day um, ETFO um, course I did. So they have Summer Academy. And it was from counting to order of operations. So that's the bonus material, because I like to give you all lots and lots of stuff. So that's the extra giveaway stuff. It's kind of like when you buy an album and there's extra tracks, like outtakes. So it's the deluxe version. And there's different, some of the, you'll notice a few things are the same in there, but the, there's different stuff too. And it goes a little farther into dividing into order of operations. So hopefully you're watching Graham's video. Um, I love his style and I love how carefully he explains things. I remember it being three minutes. It might be more like four or five. I'm going to check that and I'll be back. So it is actually seven. So for compromise, I'm going to wait exactly seven minutes. But the multiplying one that's coming up later, I'll leave you to watch it on your own time. I think this is important, though. Yeah, just as you finish up, I thought a comp, it's already 825, so I don't think we'll watch his multiplication and division one. It's very good, though. I love the style. But take the link and watch it later. You're getting them all in an email tomorrow. We're trying to do, like, bonus, bonus material tonight. And I'm free to think about all holidays because we never stop learning. Um, quick note here. Remember that it's just Graham's viewpoint. And so if you work with Bob's knows landscape, it's just her viewpoint, or Alex Lawson's, or whoever. Things would vary slightly. That said, I think there's sort of like broad agreement on the order kids um, learn things. So there was a link to that landscape. Now here's where, and we will use the chat box on this. So I've taken three problems from What to Look For by Alex Lawson. Uh, if you do have that book, you get a code for all the videos. It's just a fun fact that it happened in Peel, and it happens to be the school my children go to. Yes, that is a coincidence. But two friends of mine were working at that school, and some of their classrooms are in, in the videos. Um, but the videos are about careful observation. I think there's maybe one video for the book on YouTube. I've used it before, but not tonight. So write some notes in the chat box about how these three things are different. We don't need technical language. You don't need to worry about what's the subtrahend tonight, you know, or what understanding. Let's just look at what's happening and what kids might do. So put, put some comments in, in the box about what's happening here or what kids might do. So say, oh, they're looking for the result. Counting back, giving things away. All require regrouping, which could be a key point. And indeed, I'm going to guess there's some videos like number one where the um, the kid struggles going down over 10. I haven't watched, but I have a strong intuition there. So requiring the knowledge of tens, which puts them past learning to count to 10, which puts them Pass, hopefully learning to count to 20. We have adding on. In number two, I might give them a number line, or you might give them concrete objects. So all can be solved using addition strategies. So we're going to get to a key point, is that um, all subtraction is really addition. All division is really multiplication. So we can just go all the way and uh, say that all arithmetic is counting of some kind. <laughs> and, and, and that might be a good way to look at it. So we build our understanding of counting by ones. We can develop all the operations from there. Um, there's really no rush to the algorithm, people. 
that's a key point. There's just really no rush. There's a lot of territory to cover and uh, fun you can have on the way. Okay, any more comments on those? I guess the assessment angle would always be, you know, where's your class at? What numbers do you need? Do you need bigger numbers for number one? Do you need it to be, you know, a couple subtractions? Do you need number two to be like 48 plus 37 because you're that point in grade two? And so on. In number three, are you just using a number line or are you about to consolidate that into that tricky algorithm? Again, it depends on your learning goal. Uh, one thing to note about these tasks is we would always have people like, well, where's my rich tasks? And I look at these and I say, oh, they're not the most interesting. Number two is just a question. But yeah, we should just call that, if you look for strategies, it's a problem. Um, it's a problem in its own right. Uh, that uh, we don't need rich, fancy tasks. And indeed, you could take these three and you could rewrite them in any number of different ways. So important. Um, if you do have Alex's book, it uh, really neatly lays out the types of addition and subtraction problems. Gosh, this is just one of those topics right now. We need our chat box for this. If you feel like um, graffitiing on the page, you can feel free. I'm going to give one right here, but I would like if you would drop some meanings of multiplication in the chat box. The one I'm dropping on the screen is scaling. It's not really a primary one. Um, repeated addition. And with my York students, we had a lot of, um, actually it was one of the things asked of them, is why do we go to repeated addition first? That's one reason I linked to um, Keith Devlin's blog post called It Ain't No Repeated Edition, uh, which, by the way, was very controversial. Um, as an intermediate teacher, though, I'll tell you this. If we teach kids that multiplication always makes numbers bigger, do you know what happens when they get to multiplying fractions? If you've ever taught it, you know. If not, think about a half times a fourth. What's happening there? So I have a half multiplier of something that's one fourth. So clearly the answer has to be one eighth. But that's smaller. It's smaller than the original two. So their understanding can break. But so in this scaling, like scaling up or scaling down or scaling by a fraction, you guys have great stuff. Here's where I reveal counting groups of, and I think that would occur early on. Here's where I re reveal in this session um, the teachers in the room at OAME 2015 in Toronto came up with 24 meanings. I mean, sorry, you read that off the screen, but um, they just kept coming and coming. I don't remember all of them. If you follow the link to his article, you're going to find some of them. The one that just... Um, blew my mind, I'll just type it now, stretching and um, compressing elastic bands. He was really fond of that one. So I think it probably relates to scaling. And you might choose to think of some number line that just stretches by a scale factor. I'm like, well, who ever thinks of multiplication like that? Maybe we could and should. Anyone have any other ones? I like what you've got, though, because I think probably arrays we have, we might not get too too much further in primary. In grade four, and we get into the standard algorithm, we might. Um, so that add area model and open array. I noticed in Alex Lawson's book, the area model doesn't quite appear. So maybe she considers it a little further along. But there's huge power in just saying, okay, my rectangle is, um, you know, six by four. Okay, let's see what else I have about multiplying. So grouping, making groups, making arrays of objects, 
can maybe move into the area model. This one I'm curious as to whether we get um, to this typically by the end of grade three, but it's some rectangle of dimensions um, base, because that's the same as the base, or it could be upside down. Some rectangle that's base times height. Uh, I think that can occur pretty early on. And another one that wasn't mentioned that's in a lot of these books and landscapes is ratio tables. Okay. Now here's where, okay, if you take a screen capture and zoom in. Okay, here's all I'm going to point to. There's skip counting errors and there's this hole. And so we've got this six times seven um, is missing, eight times seven is missing. So this would be maybe more, you know, as we get into you know, the end of grade three, and maybe we get into the end of grade four and we're going to develop the times tables. But notice that big hole. And so it's these facts that are forgotten. And you know why? Because we can easily skip count by twos, even threes and fives. And we've got most of them. Add in a few sevens and we're going to have all of them up to 100. But um, the sevens give kids trouble. The nines can give kids trouble. Just depends. Um, the link that just came up, I wrote. So assessment is sitting beside. And I'm just going to point to skip counting errors in several places, including these columns. Uh, if there's anything you'd want to say to this kid, just type it in the chat box. Or if there's a question you'd want to ask, If there's anything at all, I can tell you what I actually did. That's okay. So I did work with him to correct the skip counting first. I was thinking, well, clearly the sort of lack of practice or maybe facility or seeing the patterns and the skip counting is the problem. So. We needed to develop that first. And this kid was older, grade seven. So it just goes to show sometimes you're going back to that grade two kind of thing. But we don't need to think of it that way. We can just think of um, something, uh, a strategy that occurs along the way. Well, how can nine by four be greater than nine times five? Okay, we already have a good question to get specific with this hundreds chart. And one key takeaway from tonight, it's not about the grade level. I could show you the same thing, and maybe it could be from grade three or grade four. Okay, there were, we'd be pushing more towards the end, probably, of grade three. But I've seen and done number talks with these ones. Tackle them head on. Lead a number talk. See what kids are thinking. Um, notice that sevens could be thorny because they're not really conducive to having. So your sort of doubling and having strategy goes out the window. So consider six times eight. So have three double eight, have four double six. Divide both by two, like it's just much more friendly. So the sevens just aren't friendly. So I say tackle it head on. So a lot of times for eight times seven, actually kids will start to give you known fact once they know it, and that's okay. But I saw this. This is pretty common. Going to eight times eight, which seems to be more known, knowing it's 64, and working backwards. So this goes to number sense. Yeah, we're going to work it up with our times tables. We're going to know them. But it's not like we're sitting down with flashcards anymore. We could be. But it's more like we're playing games, playing with the hundreds chart, doing number talks, doing interesting tasks, more likely that. Okay. 
Yeah, I'm just going back to this question. Have you seen the pattern in the table? Some columns and rows match each other. Yeah, so can you think of a fact that you know? So this would be like, is there any that you are, oops, that's an accidental mark, that you are really good and familiar with and working from there? So that probably relates to here. So if I said I know this, can it help me to know this? Sure, it definitely can. Um, this is only partially a joke, but as you get towards the standard algorithm, and again, there's no hurry, just design that one lesson plan. It could be half an hour of your life. It could be an hour. You could teach them um, why the standard multiplication algorithm works. Don't just throw it to them. And don't just give it as a trick or a procedure to be followed. It is that. But I think you want to develop some sense of it. I'm not exactly going to go into it tonight, but in the other slideshow I mentioned from Etho, it's in there. Um, one of the best ways is to think about partial products. So if it's two digit, well, you can start by two digit by one digit. But if it's two digit by one digit, the algorithms is totaling those four pieces as if of a rectangle. And that's a really important point. Um, and it links to James Tanton, great mathematician, talking about the area model. Okay, so for me, that's the key to the standard algorithm. You may have a different way to teach it. Let kids get their algorithm license. Okay, uh, this one is important to me. And I've done this live with adults, similar facts. Do this one. Do it in your head somehow. You can put in the chat box sort of what you did. If you're feeling brave, you can uh, graffiti on the screen. Nobody's done that. But um, certainly put in the chat box. And yes, you can do 24 times 18 in your head. And you're probably tired. But just push. Um, push through this one. And I'm going to think about 24 times 18 fresh myself for two minutes. So this, the strategy is starting to develop. I think it here's where I just really, like, if we really do value thinking, if I make an error along the way or I give you something partial um, along the way, let's accept that and value it, then let's push. You know, that's the assessment developmental perspective as well. Because um, already we have an, an oops. You know, and it looks like the consensus in the room is going to be... Um, 432. You get some like beautiful revelations along the way. We've tried this with parents and they're like, really, I can do that? Um, this is what I did tonight. I might do it differently tomorrow. I went with doubling and halving. So I went with 12 times 36. And then I went with 12 times 12, um, yeah, it's hard to write with these, times 3. And so I just said, okay, sure, 144 times 3. That's me. Not 144 times 3 was some tricky mental math, but I actually powered through it. I wouldn't expect this in young kids. Uh, you can explicitly teach the doubling and halving. And if you look at Kathy Fosno's work, she has strings that are designed just for that. It just beautifully get you to think about doubling and halving. You'd probably start much smaller. You know, again, and like 6 times 4 is a good example. Have 6, double 4, so that it gets like commutativity. Um, let's see. So if you did make an error, then you, this is easily, easy to check. So it's 432, right? Um, let's see, 24 times 9 is 216. So double that, you get 2. So doubling. 
and then 24 times 20 minus 24 times 2. So you've that beautiful sense of taking out two groups of 24. A few people did that. We have, so in Melanie's case, breaking down all the groups, so as if it was the standard algorithm. Um, I've met people who do that standard algorithm in their head. So Melanie's at 842 is most like that. Um, and you could show kids that. And I was suggesting showing with a rectangle. But if it's truly open array, I go, OK, my thinking is 20 times 10, and then my 20 times 8. Then I need 4 times 10 and 4 times 8. And you get there. Uh, wonderful thinking. So uh, mental math is such a powerful thing for kids. We should not shy away from it. So I thought we'd show our thinking. Um, so Graham's video, I'll definitely leave for for later. Uh, she did it with the place value, Melanie says. So like with the front end addition. So is that probably I think I know what you mean. If we were in a classroom, I would push further. And I might even take some notes on your thinking that day. So my friend Chess, because it is 432, so 240 times 2 does not work because, well, it does work if you take away 48. So all you had to do is take away two groups of 24, and you're there. This one is getting you thinking about multiplying. Is 2 times 6 the same as 6 times 2? Yes, if it's a rectangle, which you can is a way to think of commutativity. So you could just put that equal sign right in the middle. But no, if you think of two copies of 6, which is what 2 times 6 means, or 6 copies of 2, that's what 6 times 2 means. By the way, there was one of those common core math problems that people were fighting about on the internet. And it was about that. It was about whether 2 times 6 or 6 times 2 is correct. It might have been a slightly different fact. But um, uh, wow, it's uh, it may matter, right? And sometimes it may not matter. So that's something for you to think about. This one, let me just check my slides here. So getting down to it. Yeah, timing's pretty good. These are actually in um, Fosno kits. So how many game pieces are needed to cover or fill each game board? Yes, the answer was 432. By the way, as you're developing these skills, feel free then to go to the calculator. Sometimes you may need to do that if you get stuck. Then come back, work it out. These are all valid things. Um, so this, just consider what kids might do if you ask this question. I've seen the, the chessboard version live uh, in at least one classroom. So what would kids do? Specifically, what would they do to avoid counting all the way from 1 to? I feel free to type, but I know it's getting near the end. But also feel free to just think about it for two minutes if you need to. I'm seeing the uh, Connect Four promotes some grouping by colors, which is interesting. So in this exact picture, there's two missing, but there's also the yellows across the top. And because it's from Fosno, there's no mistakes in Fosno. It's very deliberate if she did it that way. So one is an eight by eight array, and one is a six by seven.
By the way, Connect 4 is a uh, solved game, so all you need to do is uh, go first, and you can beat your own son or daughter or students every single time. <laughs> now, it's um, in game theory, people have examined um, these things, so it's actually solved, which kind of takes the fun away. But anyway, chess is most definitely not solved in any possible way. It's kind of the infinite game. Um, I'm loving the ideas. And as we reach the end, I'll just reveal, so from John So's class, he did the fractions webinar a week or two ago. So you see, um, looks like the kid did sketch 64 squares, but some didn't need to. And in his talk, he was looking at groups of eight into 16s, into 32s. So in his talk, he was looking at more efficient groupings. Which will be my final message about assessment. What's your learning goal? What's the curriculum? Where are you trying to go with it? Um, so John, find him on Twitter, Mr. So Classroom, is one of the most skilled at consolidating the lesson that I've ever seen. So he'll just write his notes for what he wants to talk about it uh, at the end. But then he just kind of knows. <laughs> and it takes a lot of work to, and uh, years to get to that skill level. But let's say you have this set set idea that in the chessboard you want to go to that fact eight times eight. How are you going to get there? Well, his way was um, doubling, groupings and doublings. So that's my final assessment message, which is the broader one um, relating to learning goals in the curriculum. We've talked a lot about sitting beside kids and valuing their thinking. Um, this is, we're not going to do this now. This is more like general thoughts. Okay, sure. Can you create a learning goal for this task? Attach it to the curriculum. Anticipate what kids would do. Anticipating is one of those most important things. And um, so anticipating means we know some things we think they'll probably do. And so after a certain while, you get intuition for it. So if I teach grade six is about adding fractions and I give a half plus a fourth, some of them are going to say one six. Now that's a misconception that you can just add top and bottom. But it happens every single time. So there's things that you can reasonably anticipate will happen. But you're the one that knows your kids. That's another assessment message. And then how would you, you sequence their work if you're getting the share, Math Congress or whatever? Or if you're picking ones to talk about, what do you want to talk about? Uh, more generally, any big and interesting ideas at play here, like commutativity or something on one of the landscapes or continua. Connect to mathematical processes. Maybe there's a specific thing you're looking at. What is happening um, as we do this task? I like Ruth's idea of adapting it for six years old, make it 24 square, call it a game board of um, whatever. Just call it something, make up the game name, just to have a little story. Yeah, and you could go there with six-year-olds. There's absolutely no reason why not. Changing the size and complexity. Um, this is the finishing slide. If there was any um, questions to come, you can uh, put them in the box. We'll be on for at least seven minutes. I just want you to remember that the early number sense landscape is complex. Remember, particularly if you're a primary junior teacher, it's highly unlikely that you're a mathematics major. And I wasn't. I was an English major. So for all of us, we are learning so much about the early number sense landscape. And so it's that limited module in teacher's college is not enough to do it. I'd recommend probably if you hadn't, pick a course. If I were to be biased, I would say pick York Primary Junior Part 1 because I'm teaching it in the winter. But the reality is pick one that suits you. There's so many universities that have it. But I think it's rebuilding that. We don't remember learning to count. We probably don't remember learning how to add and subtract. I don't remember learning to multiply. 
that all happens. So it's relearning it for ourselves. That is mathematical content knowledge for teaching. Knowing math, knowing how to teach it. My final message, always, if you can, think of assessment as sitting beside. Talk to kids. Listen to them. Use those developmental continua to see where they're at in their thinking. That's good assessment. Make the continua itself the focus for the landscape, whatever it is. Doesn't have to be some fancy framework or a fancy way of recording. Scribble your observations on a napkin for all I care. Just have them. Okay? Pay attention to student thinking. Ideally, you'd be like, you know, my kid's stuff comes home in Seesaw. Or it's Google Drive. Or it's some notebook that you have. Or you have an actual landscape you photocopied and you're making notes for different kids on it. Whatever you do, it's the observing and the conversation part that's so key. Pay attention to kids' thinking. So mathematics is a thinking tool, not just a subject in school. I made that up because it rhymes, but it works. It's a thinking tool, not just a subject in school. Like literally something we can use to um, describe, think about the world. It's uncannily good at um, describing the world, mathematics is. You have no idea, and I have no idea because it's, um, I want, there's so much more I want to learn, but a lot of these papers and theoretical things are beyond me, but it's, all I know is that they're just always discovering new things. And they're like, well, this mathematics isn't going to mean anything. And then 20 years later, it will be used in, like, um, um, crypt cryptography is a good example, multiplying giant prime numbers together. So and all, nobody thought that was useful. Bam, it's like what keeps your money safe, your online banking, you know, your, your email or whatever. Just one example. Because mathematics is interesting and it's lovely and beautiful. So... Thank you very much for coming tonight. Um, hopefully some of these links will have stuff that you come back to. If that matters, I want you to have the takeaways and uh, lots of stuff to think about. And uh, hopefully as you get through the last three weeks and three days, that uh, you look forward to your rest and uh, stay, stay happy and healthy. Thanks for coming tonight. All right, good night. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, great session again. Um, one of the things that makes my role uh, quite challenging as a moderator is that all of facilitators are truly exceptional teachers. And I keep repeating the same compliments and the same positive feedback at the end of each session. So that, that's not easy to, uh, to always be original. But um, I particularly love the way Matt uh, keeps improvising throughout his sessions. Uh, some presentations are more academic and uh, they feel a bit more like uh, university lectures, and some are more creative and uh, free-flowing. And um, I guess I don't have to tell you in which category Matt's presentation falls into. Um, what's nice is that we can actually hear his mind grinding through the session. And uh, tonight I actually heard all your minds uh, grinding as well. So it was a, a lot of fun, I think. Um, as always, I uh, definitely want to uh, thank you all for being uh, such fantastic teachers and participants and for sharing your ideas uh, all along the session. Uh, Francesca, Deidre, Melanie, Caroline, um, well, all of you, I can't name you all, but uh, thanks for your active participation tonight. Uh, you, you, know, you, you guys were really great. I, I think it was a fantastic session once again. Um, now, if you could please give me another five minutes of your time for my little spiel at the end of, uh, of every session. So, um, I just want to um, share with you the list of our upcoming sessions. We are nearing the end of uh, the 2017 season already, unbelievable, but we still have uh, se seven uh, fantastic sessions before the end of the year. Um, I'll post the link to the to our um, calendar so you can explore it yourself, but I just want to point a few. We have a session on teachers' mental health on Friday with uh, two new facilitators. I, I think it's going to be very interesting. And then on December 5, we have a, a session on uh, TED -ed, uh, TEDx um, talks, uh, which is going to be really interesting as well. Um, and then another session by a new facilitator on December 7 on stress behavior versus misbehavior. 
again, uh, a very interesting topic, I think. And then last but not least, uh, the same evening, December 7, we have a session by Maria Van Vallis. Uh, Maria's session will discuss how to support students to help them to help them engage in um, sound mathematical thinking. And I warmly recommend that session. Maria is uh, truly an exceptional presenter. So that's uh, on December 7 for all uh, the math genius that you guys are. If you want to join that session, that would be great. Uh, I'm going to just paste for you the links to our calendar and to our resource page if you want to explore that on your own time. Um, I also want to tell you about the opportunity provided by OTF and the Ministry of Education. If you're a qualified teacher and you have completed an additional qualification course in math, technology, or kindergarten, you may be eligible for a $450 subsidy. And I'm going to provide you the link to uh, apply for that subsidy if you want, here's the link. Um, I also want to remind you that we really need your feedback. We really value your feedback. When quitting Blackboard, you will be presented with the opportunity to give us your feedback on tonight's session and fill a short online uh, questionnaire. Uh, the survey only takes a few minutes, so if you can do it right after the session, that would be greatly appreciated. You should be redirected automatically to the survey page when quitting Blackboard, but I'll provide you with the links as well, just in case. Once you have completed the feedback questionnaire, you will be redirected to another page, to a second page, allowing you to enter your name, and you will then receive a certificate of participation to this training session, and you can uh, then add that um, certificate of participation to your professional resume. Uh, please note that the certificate of participation is only available for 48 hours following this session. And if you don't have the time to do any of this tonight, don't worry because we will send you tomorrow a follow-up email with a link to tonight's um, presentation as well as the feedback survey, uh, the uh, the archive presentation and all the links that uh, Matt has shared with you tonight. So no worries. But I'm just going to paste the links in the chat box for the uh, feedback survey and for the certificate of participation. You may want to grab them just in case. And I'm also going to paste the link for tonight's resource page. It will be live in a couple of hours. I'll, I'll have a quick uh, dinner and then I'll upload everything on the OTF website for you guys. So <clears throat> that's it. Um, I will now end the recording of the session. Please feel free to remain online if you wish to ask Matthew additional questions uh, once the recording has ended. Otherwise, I wish you all a very, very good evening. Thank you once again for your participation in tonight's session. We certainly hope to see you soon again on OTF Connects. Bonne fin de soirée à tous et à toutes et à bientôt sur OTF Connex. Merci.